Okay, great. Well, what we want to talk about today is a final report, really, for an STTR that we just completed. Uh, it's a phase one where we looked at air vehicle gust response for uh, early design. And so uh, we've been involved with VSP for quite a while, and we've used VSP integrally for this project, and we thought there'd be a lot of interest here. Uh, so basically, we're uh, partnering with Auburn University in this case, Dr. Ramon Chakraborty is the Auburn University contact on this one, and uh, Aman is gonna come on board and give part of the presentation, a good part of it. Uh, he's the one that did the flight dynamics and a lot of other things that you'll see here. Uh, we did the the, re the flight stream and the research and flight uh, part of the of the project. Research and flight was the, was the, uh, our, uh, the, the uh, SBC in this case, so. Uh, so flight stream uh, basically is a, a very efficient subsonic inviscid surface vorticity solver. Uh, it started back in about 2013 as a, a project uh, that we decided we wanted to bring to the commercial environment. And uh, so we've started uh, with some SBRs uh, from NASA Langley in about 2014. And uh, so we've had several SBR phase ones and STTR phase ones and a phase two and a, and a phase two E um, to continue developing uh, flight stream and it's now become used uh, really around the world. Um, it doesn't need a volume mesh, of course, it's a, a surface solver uh, and in, it generates results very quickly and, and robustly uh, for the most part. Uh, physics based Flow separation has been added as part of our phase one, phase two, phase two E program that we've uh, just now finishing up. Uh, we offer propeller modeling both in the steady case with the actuator disc theory uh, from Conway and the unsteady solver allows us to do rotating blades. Uh, so uh, we believe our, our uh, UI to be pretty intuitive uh, but it's also scriptable. So we've had people running flight stream through these uh, MDAO type environments, uh, and we offer some graphical interactivity and post-processing. So, uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll uh, move on. Uh, just mentioning a little bit about our involvement with VSP. Uh, in 2014, we went to the VSP workshop in San Luis Obispo, and introduced flight stream uh to the to this community really uh with some vsp models and uh ever since then and continuing to today uh we use vsp pretty heavily uh as one of our mechanisms for getting geometry into to flight stream uh and for this project we use vsp pretty heavily and iman's going to show you some very interesting stuff i think that we were able to do with the vsp models uh, there's several different ways that you can get VSP geometers into flight stream. Uh, VSP now offers CAD export, which uh, we can export and have done uh, quite a few examples with. Uh, but then, uh, you know, the thing that we probably rely on the most is comp geom uh, to do direct mesh creation or manipulation in VSP and then export that to flight stream. Uh, we do now have some mechanisms to do control surface deflection. Uh, we're still in the process of refining and improving that capability, but uh, that's a really nice way to get deflected surfaces into flight stream. Uh, we're looking at now more robust ways to connect VSP with, uh, without having to go through the CAD uh, functionality. So. All right, so uh, of course, we've done a lot of validation studies with FlightStream over the years, uh, but for the, the, the project that we were talking about here with this SDTR has uh, been really UAM related. Uh, and so uh, the LA-8 configuration at Langley has been a, a very instrumental piece of our validation for this particular project and uh, Steve Guther there at Langley has uh, both run the wind tunnel test and uh, done some validation work himself. Uh, we followed up on that with some more validation work and here you're seeing 
the wind tunnel results from the 12 foot tunnel at Langley compared with the flight stream results. And so you can see why you really need something more uh, detailed than something like a vortex lattice code. Uh, we do capture the complex geometric effects here on the arrow loads. And you can also notice that we capture the flow separation pretty well. So uh, really quite pleased with these LA8 validation results. Um, this is just a little bit more uh, to show some of our comparisons. We uh, have a paper at SciTech next year to, to uh, outline all this in much more detail, but uh, here we're just looking at drag coefficient and moment coefficient. Uh, we've been quite pleased with, with the results on both. Uh, so, <clears throat> uh, all right, so kind of just a little bit of a summary of the flight stream stuff. Uh, it's a vorticity based solver developed uh, by research in flight over a, a period of about six or seven years here uh, to mature. And it's now matured into something that we think is very uh, quite capable for this STTR project. We started developing that additional capability using a tool called CLASP, uh, Control Load Alleviation Simulation Platform. That's Amon's part of this project, and Amon's going to spend quite a bit of time uh, describing that in, uh, in just a few minutes. All right, I'm going to let Amon talk about the next couple of slides, and I'll come back and talk a little bit more about flight stream. All right, thanks, Roy. Um, so, uh, like Roy mentioned, CLASP is uh, a uh, MATLAB simulink based tool that we've created as part of uh, uh, this project in order to study flight dynamics of UAM type vehicles, especially gust encounters. So, it stands for Controls and Load Alleviation Simulation Platform. It's meant to be modular and uh, quickly reconfigurable to be adaptable for different types of. Uh, uh, UAM aircraft uh, geometry. The idea is to provide a test bed where we can study flight dynamics of novel configurations. We can implement some flight control laws and, and see how those perform, where we can run the airplane into turbulence and gust encounters, and also where we can study what the structural loads are and the effects of structural flexibility. So our, our focus thus far has been on basically hooking together this framework and getting it to a point where even if the underlying analyses are somewhat simplified, the we have a proof of concept of the integrated functionality. So CLASP allows us to uh, model sensors and flight control laws, as well as gust load alleviation algorithms and the dynamics of control effectors. So for instance, uh, control surface is an example of a control effector. Propulsors for UAM type of vehicles are also examples of control effectors, and they all have their individual dynamics. They're not instantaneously acting. So we can model those within class. Uh, we can visualize the flight of the aircraft by, uh, by an interface with Flight Gear Flight Simulator. We'll see some examples of that uh, later on. We have the ability to do closed loop simulation, so with the controllers active, um, we use um, rigid body equations of motion, six DOF, about the mean axes, and we use the mean axes because that allows us to use uh, modal approximation for, for the structural uh, dynamics. And at the core of this, um, we have the aeropropulsive characteristics of the aircraft, which are derived from flight stream analyses and which then get uh, incorporated within the class framework. Uh, either as lookup tables or embedded analyses or reduced order models of, of some sort. Yeah, okay. So uh, without getting into too much detail, uh, I'll just come make a few comments about this gust modeling capability. Uh, we have a, a complex uh, looking a little diagram here, but, but uh, the part about flight stream it is shown in the orange boxes here. So uh, where, where we interact with the uh, with the uh, class functionality, but basically with flight stream, we we have the geometry coming in with control effectors and propulsors. We we put in a whatever position orientation is required, then we run through an unsteady solver uh, and look at the evolved loads uh, and. So the, and, and we're able to then output the loads to the six off. So uh, we'll close the loop by going back through the time-dependent boundary and the time-dependent weight 
uh, evolution, uh, reposition the geometry, do the unsteady solver again. So, uh, and then the the output interacts with the Iman's clasp tool here. So, we'll go to the next next slide. Um, yeah, so this kind of just gives you a little bit of an idea about what we did in the phase one. Uh, we had a, a flight stream uh, reducing the order of the arrow to a, a reduced order uh, strip type model, and Mon will talk a little bit about that. Uh, we have a prototype error propulsive model, axial flow uh, rotors, and uh, a 2D GUS model. Uh, the class framework then uh, has been worked out for forward flight, and we're doing a prototype class uh, structural dynamics model. And then, uh, of course, we have prepared a report, which just we presented that just last week. So, this is basically the report on all of our activities. So, next slide, I'm on. Um, in order to be able to do this problem, we had to put in motion definition. And this slide just describes a little bit about the motion definition capabilities we've added to flight stream. Uh, we've got standard translation and rotation velocities, but also custom motion tables um, and uh, six off integration with, uh, with with some additional motion capability there. So uh, we, we can talk a lot more about that offline, but. Uh, uh, we do have an unsteady solver. Uh, it's unsteady at the surface, and uh, we have unsteady loads that we're able to generate with rotating propellers. Uh, and so this kind of forms the foundation of what we're doing with this gust modeling. I, I won't get into too much detail there with exactly all the details of the of the unsteady solver, but uh, but just uh, this is just illustrating our capability to do both. Uh, six off type motion and propeller blade rotation with the effects on the wings there. All right, fine. yeah, so the initial gust model is just this one minus cosine uh, kind of simplified approach. Uh, this was just uh, to get something in for phase one that would work uh, and would be reasonable. So we have user defined gradients uh, and the gust velocity variation in flight stream is time-based and coupled to the unsteady solver. And uh, the atmosphere is assumed to be one-dimensional in this first approach. And, and so you can see in this slide what these gust models actually look like. Uh, so uh, this is really just a plot of the function for some different input conditions. Okay. Um, so, uh, of course, in our STTR reporting, we have to talk about the technical merit and uh, flight stream basically allows for the rapid analysis of unconventional aircraft using this unique capability for surface uh, vorticity solving and, and flow separation uh, with some viscous effects added. So it's kind of a middle of the road in terms of fidelity, but it offers the speed required to actually approach this gust modeling problem. Uh, I'm going to give uh, Amon a chance to talk a little bit more about the gust definition when he gets to his, his slide. So, uh, yeah, there we go. So, the gust encounter problem is just illustrated here in this little video. Uh, you can see what happens uh, over here to the to the load as the gust goes over the airplane. So, this is basically just a, a time-dependent evolution of the gust passing over an airplane in forward flight. Okay. All right, so this reduced order model uh, essentially reduces, in order for us to be able to interact with Amon's clasp tool, we reduce all the arrow to, uh, in this case, a quarter cord imposition of loads along the wing. This allows us to go to a strip model and interact with the flight dynamics software uh, and mo simplified models. Uh, and this is kind of a, a, a novel approach that we've decided to take with this particular project uh, because basically what the whole idea here is it allows us to get better fidelity loads than you could get with vortex lattice, but still apply the loads in the same way you would apply the loads if they, as if they had come from a vortex lattice tool. All right, I'm on. Uh, so this is just some examples of some reduced order model loads that we've gotten from the LA-8. 
Okay, I'm on. All right. Um, so we to do the error analysis uh, and flight gear, Amon, you may want to talk a little bit more about this, but basically we were able to generate an open VSP model and uh, put it in the flight stream, get the loads, and then Amon was able to uh, take CLASP and interact with flight gear. So did you want to say anything else about this one, Amon? Uh, nope, uh, uh, I can just uh, step in from here. So. Yeah. So what we've got is uh, we've got uh, a couple of different ways uh, we're using geometry in this project. And so the starting point is an open VSP model that you see uh, over here. And the top track is that open VSP model then gets exported and then brought into flight stream, which is where we do the uh, error propulsive analyses and generate uh, either lookup tables or whatever other type of reduced order model we're gonna be using. And then those characteristics get embedded within the class simulink framework, which we're going to look at in more detail. The other track, um, mostly for the for the flight simulation and uh, visualization track, is the same open VSP model gets exported into AC3D, which is a which is a geometry rendering tool, and we create a flight gear aircraft model for flight gear flight simulator. And when class Simulink model operates, it actually pushes data and interfaces with the flight gear flight simulator. And that provides us a visual rendering of uh, the flight and trajectory of, of the aircraft. So now uh, let's talk. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, how we model the flight dynamics and the structural dynamics of the aircraft within uh, class. So as Roy uh, alluded to previously, uh, we use a strip theory based uh, aerodynamics model, air propulsive model. So uh, the idea is that um, uh, the lifting surfaces on the aircraft, and for phase one, we've just concentrated this to the to the fore and aft wings. Uh, we look at the um, aerodynamic loads as a buildup of loads over a large number of uh, spanwise uh, strips on these wings, and at each of these strips, uh, we can compute what the local incidence angle seen by that strip is by looking at the gross motion of the airplane so its uh, attitude relative to the oncoming free stream any angular rates like roll pitch yaw rates that it has uh, the geometric location of where those strips are as well as the effects of uh, downwash uh, and also if there's any structural deformation going on then that's going to create a normal component of of velocity seen by the strip uh, as well also, as Roy alluded to, then what happens is using the strip theory based uh, model, uh, sectional loads are, are basically originate at the quarter court point of uh, these strip airfoils. And depending on where that quarter court point is, we then sum up the loads and moments relative to the aircraft's moment reference center. So that in a nutshell is how uh, the, the strip theory based uh, model works. So in, in, uh, in phase one of this effort, uh, we focused on forward flight conditions, uh, and we haven't looked in great detail at the effect of prop wash going over, over the wing. So uh, those are all uh, activities that we've got lined up. Uh, if we have a phase two uh, funded, and we also want to have a tighter integration between the reduced order model that Roy mentioned that would come out of flight stream and then directly integrate into, into CLASP. So here's a top level uh, overview of the uh, class framework, the controls and load alleviation simulation platform. So this is a Simulink model, and this is the top level of that uh, model. Uh, we have in this uh, sensor models block uh, models for the dynamics of sensors. So the difference between a true state and a sensed state as sensed by the sensor. So obviously these sensors have their own dynamics, uh, probably bias or any noise. So those things we can uh, model uh, within this block. So flight control system, FCS and gust load alleviation, GLA, so the control laws uh, for closed loop control of the vehicle, those are all modeled within here and there's great flexibility as to the type of controllers uh, that are modeled. Uh, and, uh, and we'll see some examples of what we've incorporated for our uh, phase one. Between a control command being generated and a control effector assuming a particular state, there's of course the dynamics of the control effectors, which we can also model by uh, anything starting from a first order dynamic to a second order dynamic or anything uh, even more customized than that. So these are all possible within the control effector dynamics block. 
we have a, a fairly robust way of defining uh, how the atmosphere itself is moving. So the ability to program in winds and gusts and turbulence. Um, this, is, uh, this is something uh, we have in this atmosphere uh, block. The main block, basically the heart of the class framework, of course, is where the air propulsive loads and structural loads and structural deformations are, are summed up. And uh, once we have the gross loads over the entire body, we integrate the uh, equations of motion to kind of com compute the time history of, uh, of the trajectory of the body. And because we use the mean axes as the vehicle deforms, uh, the center of gravity of the vehicle will also move. Uh, you imagine the wings bending, um, that's going to result in a movement of the center of gravity. And the mean axis approach um, requires that the position of the center of gravity is, is tracked for, for the uh, rigid body equations of, of motion. And then finally, we have, as I mentioned, this output to flight gear uh, flight simulator that allows us to see a visual rendering of, of the motion. So uh, now I'll talk a little bit about the, uh, the gust uh, alleviation algorithm we've got uh, uh, implemented right now. Hey, Mo, so, if I could pause you for just yes, a moment, we have uh, several questions here in the Q&A. Oh, really? And, uh, you know, before we continue on, so regarding the Simulink uh, control system model, is that open source or is that uh, all controlled and, uh, and owned by flight, research and flight? Well, it's very much in the development stages right now, the CLASP framework. Uh, it is something that uh, we ultimately uh, plan on commercializing. So okay. um, the end goal is it would be available as a commercial tool, just like FlightStream is. All right, understood. And uh, could you elaborate on the type of controller that was implemented uh, within this algorithm? Absolutely. Actually, I was going to walk through that uh, in the in the following oh, slides. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, Another couple questions, just very briefly. Uh, can the derivatives and the lookup tables mentioned in the MATLAB 6 DOF model be reliably extracted from OpenVSP, or do you rely on FlightStream for that? We rely on FlightStream for the aerodynamic analyses that generate the lookup tables. Wonderful. And uh, it, now we've got a question here that says, it looks like FlightStream assumes a rigid structure. Can it also work with a flexible structure, or is it all rigid body? Yeah, no, I can answer that. Yeah, of course, it's the steady solver assumes it's a rigid body, but the but we do have an unsteady solver that is uh, uh, able to do the the non rigid structure problem. Wonderful. Thank you very much for answering those questions, and uh, I'll go ahead and mute, and uh, you proceed. Thank you so much. Okay, so since we had a question, let's talk about the gustal alleviation. So. Um, Imagine there's a vein at the nose of the aircraft which picks up uh, angle of attack. Uh, the thing to note is because there's an offset between the airplane uh, re and reference point, you can think of it as a CG, and the vein, the angle of attack that's being picked up by the vein is also affected by any angular motions of, of the aircraft. So we're able to model within class what the angle of attack sensed by the vein is as a function of where the vein is located and the, and the motion of the aircraft. And then, obviously, since this angle of attack vein has, is bound to have dynamics of its own, we can represent the dynamics of that sensor in as simplified or as complicated a manner as we want. So there can be n number of sensor states. And then the gust alleviation algorithm, of course, we don't want it to respond to the total sensed alpha. We want it to respond only to the gust-induced angle of attack. So there is a way to extract then the gust-induced angle of attack from the total angle of attack seen by the vein. Now, there are two ways of looking at this, uh, and that depends on whether we assume that there's a change in the gust field velocity over the dimension of the, of the vehicle. So if you imagine, is the velocity of the gust changing over this length of the, of the vehicle? If the answer to that is no, then we can just calculate the angle of attack at the vein based on the relative location of the vane relative to the reference point where the aircraft motion states are calculated. On the other hand, if you have a velocity field where there is appreciable variation of velocity between any two points on the vehicle at the same time, then as we'll see later, what we can do is we can just add the position of this angle of attack uh, sensor to a list of query points which are used to query the state of the atmosphere so we can get the velocities uh, over here uh, directly. So I mentioned about the sensor dynamics over there, and this is how we can extract the gust-induced contribution to the 
angle of attack from the total angle of attack picked up by the vein. And without going into the details of this equation, the way this is done is you basically subtract out the components to angle of attack due to the rigid body motion of the aircraft. And when you subtract that from the total angle of attack, you end up with the gust induced contribution. And that's what the gust load alleviation algorithm will uh, respond to. So there's a, also a question about the flight controls architecture. So here's what we've uh, implemented for now. Our focus has been mainly on longitudinal uh, dynamics with uh, vertical gusts. So if you look at the top track over here, we have, uh, we have uh, an altitude hold autopilot, which is trying to maintain a commanded altitude. And based on the error in altitude, it's, it's developing a pitch attitude command. And there's a pitch hold controller and pitch damper, which is basically attaining that pitch angle command uh, by, uh, by basically moving the elevons of the uh, LA-8 uh, configuration. So that's one signal in the longitudinal channel. The other one is the GLA controller. So the GLA controller is exercising PD or proportional derivative control based on the gust-induced angle of attack. And it's trying to keep that um, gust-induced angle of attack to a zero, so counteracting it. And that's also adding to the longitudinal channel. So these two controllers, they're basically uh, summing on top of one another and generating the elevon command or the longitudinal control command. And on the lateral side, we just have uh, whatever we would need to keep the wings level. So we have a wing leveler or a bank hold. And not shown on this image, there's also a, a yaw damper, which will, uh, which will prevent any kind of Dutch roll uh, excitation. Now, I'll talk a little bit about uh, wind gust and turbulence models. So this is actually a dedicated uh, block or subsystem within uh, class. And uh, we have a number of ways we can make the atmosphere move in here. So there are already horizontal wind and von Karman uh, turbulence models that are available as part of Simulink's aerospace block set. So those are in here and they work just fine. The only thing to remember is that they are generating gross movement of the atmosphere. You can't have any variation between two points on the on the airplane at the at the same time. But we anticipate that for our specific problem, we're going to have plenty of cases where uh, the wind velocity changes over the span of the body. So we have this uh, user-defined velocity field as well. And here, the user would have full freedom to define velocity components as a function of x, y, z, and t. So basically, spatiotemporal variations of the velocity field can be can be defined here. And any number of points on the vehicle. Uh, the, the locations of those points can be used to query that velocity field and see what the velocities are seen by those points. So query points in our case would be all the aerodynamic centers of all the strips on the vehicle, as well as the locations of any uh, air data probes on the vehicle. So we would want to query the velocities seen by each of these points because they factor into various calculations uh, downstream. So now uh, for the air propulsive and, and structural loads, basically here's what's uh, happening. So obviously in order to calculate deflections uh, of the body, we need, to, um, we need to have the distributed uh, loads over the flexible structures. And with those flexible loads, we have a modal approximation based uh, structural dynamics model that can compute uh, the deformed state of the wings. So the wings have degrees of freedom in bending and uh, torsion, so we can compute the bending and torsion states of each of the wings, as well as the rates at which those states are, are changing. And this information is then propagated to the uh, aeropropulsive uh, block, which is the blue block that you see over here. The important thing to note over here is obviously in early uh, simulations, we might want to just simulate rigid body motion. So this entire block can be deactivated and that with one click, and that basically makes the whole uh, airplane a rigid body. Now with that, uh, with the instantaneous structural uh, deformed state of the structure, the strip theory model then calculates the loads uh, that are that are developed on the uh, on the airplane, and those loads are first of all summed up to get the gross vehicle uh, loads, forces, and moments, and those quantities go to the equations of motion. The other thing that goes to equations of motion would be angular momenta of all spinning rotors and propellers on the aircraft. So if there's an angular momentum uh, imbalance over the aircraft, and if you couple that with the rate of the aircraft, you're going to get a gyroscopic moment. 
So we propagate that as well. So the equations of motion are affected by any such moments if they're, if they're there. The same loads uh, in a distributed manner uh, get put into a load matrix, which has basically the distribution of bending and torsion loads over all the flexible structures. And that goes right back into the structural dynamics uh, block to compute the new deformed state. So this is happening uh, at every uh, time step of the simulation. The structural dynamics modeling that we've got uh, so far for phase one assumes that the only flexible components on the aircraft are the, are the four wings, and they're modeled as cantilever box beams. So they're rigidly fixed at one end, and they're uh, cantilever free at the other end. And they have degrees of freedom in uh, bending in the, in the lift direction, if you will, and also torsion in the in the twist direction. And for phase one, we've assumed that the bending and torsion modes are, are, are uncoupled. And it's just a simplification made to do an initial uh, implementation. We've uh, sized the, um, the box beam based on a small optimization problem. So it's basically, if you assume that the leading and trailing edges are at fixed locations, how thick do you need to make the box beam? in order to satisfy a tip deflection and a tip twist constraint, as well as a lower bounds on first bending and first torsion frequencies, subject to a certain uh, NG load condition. So that's solved as a small uh, pre-processing optimization problem. And once that problem is solved, we, uh, we get the uh, uh, bending and torsion mode frequencies as well as mode shape. So you see um, the bottom right, uh, the first three mode shapes for bending and, and torsion, as well as uh, the frequencies for bending and, and torsion modes. These all get uh, embedded into our structural dynamics uh, model. And the way we calculate the deformed shape of, uh, of, the, of the wings as a function of time is by a modal uh, approximation method. So what that does is it it evaluates the physical deflected state as a truncated summation of those mode shapes that you saw, along with generalized uh, coordinates representing bending and torsion. And the user has freedom over how many modes of that infinite summation the user wants to keep before chopping off the sum and truncating it. So within the uh, structural dynamics uh, module, so we have these uh, distributed loads that, uh, that come in. And if you have structural modes in bending and torsion whose frequencies are close enough to the rigid body frequencies that you want to actually integrate them together with the rigid body motion, then that can be done. So here you have actual uh, time integration of uh, bending and torsion modes whose frequencies are relatively low. If, on the other hand, you have um, bending and torsion modes whose frequencies are high, uh, then what that basically means is that as far as the rigid body motion of the aircraft is concerned, relative to that, those particular modes are always in quasi-static equilibrium. So then we don't bother with uh, time domain integration and we just uh, propagate the quasi-static deflections directly. So in a typical problem, the lower few modes will be time integrated and higher frequency modes will just have the quasi-static uh, contributions. And finally, the, the modal coordinates are abstract coordinates. They have to be con uh, converted back into physical coordinates, so things we can visualize, like a bending deflection or a torsional twist, and the rates at which these deflections are, are happening. And these will then get output to air propulsive and, and mass properties modules. Uh, one interesting thing we had to figure out was, how do we trim this flexible airplane? And not only how do we trim it, how do we trim it um, without having to change the setup of the trim problem if we decide to switch the structural dynamic stuff off and do a rigid body simulation. So uh, the flowchart on the right shows what we ultimately came up with. So you have uh, the, the trim algorithm is actually an optimizer. The reason we've set it up as an optimizer and not a root solver is because we totally foresee uh, trim for these UAM type vehicles as being, as being a, a um, uh, a, um, I mean, these are all under; these are all overactuated systems. So there are far greater number of control knobs than the degrees of motion freedom of the body. So, in the general cases, there will be more than one unique uh, trim solution. So to choose among them, we have to minimize some kind of an objective function. So that's why trim is set up as a as a as a an, a optimization problem. 
And the optimizer is basically passing down trial solutions of control and state variables. So control variables, you can imagine, would be control deflections or propulsive RPMs or blade pitch. And state variables would be angles of attack, angle of side slip, and so on. And for each such trial solution, we first iterate the aerodynamics and the structural uh, dynamics to a, an internal convergence. So think of it as exposing the aircraft to the uh, airstream and letting the flexible structure blow itself into an equilibrated state. And then once that internal convergence has happened, we then go and check whether uh, the six degree of freedom equations of motion are satisfied. So is there dynamic equilibrium there? And any other state residuals, uh, if applicable, are they satisfied? And then what is the what is the value of the objective function for, for trim? And then these are fed back to the optimizer, which then goes through this process again, trying to minimize the objective function. So the advantage of this is at a click, you can just turn this off. And then you're basically solving the rigid body uh, trim problem. And the optimizer doesn't really care whether it's trimming a flexible or a rigid airplane. OK, so uh, now we just look at a couple of uh, quick results. and. Um, We've simulated a symmetric gust encounter, so longitudinal motion only. We've uh, simulated an asymmetric gust encounter, which is uh, basically just one half of the airplane. So just imagine the right wings encountering a gust and nothing happening to the left wings. And then uh, turbulence. Okay, so here's a symmetric gust encounter uh, simulated by class. So um, there you see the wings deforming as the gust uh, hits first the front wing and then the aft wing, and you can see control surface deflections as the, as the controllers try to counteract the effect of the gust. So just to set up a baseline case, if you look at the dotted black line, that's what would happen if the vehicle got hit by the gust and took no control action. So it's an open loop controls fixed case. And what you see, of course, here is the beginning of a fugoid cycle. So if we had simulated this for 100 or 200 seconds, you'd have seen a, a fugoid cycle uh, developing over there. But that's just a, a reference case. The blue line is what would happen if you had an altitude hold autopilot on without any gust load alleviation system. So the first uh, thing you see is that that controller works the altitude back to the equilibrium altitude. So it prevents um, the excursion in altitude, but it doesn't really do much for the load factor. So if you look at the peak load factor on the positive side between the black line and the blue line, Shaves a little bit off, but but not much. That's because it's responding to change in altitude, not change in angle of attack. If you look at the red line, that's the effect of the gust load alleviation system being on on top of the uh, flight control system. And if you look at the angle of attack excursion for this red line, you'll see that the angle of attack seen by the vehicle, the change in angle of attack is a lot smaller. That's because the gust load alleviation algorithm has been counteracting the gust-induced angle of attack. So the angle of attack peak is a lot lower. Angle of attack directly related to the amount of excess lift, which is directly related to the load factor. And as a result, you see the peak load factor here is, a, is, a, is lower. But at the same time, the control action taken is a lot more aggressive. So if you look at the red control input for the yellow bonds versus the blue control input, that's a lot more aggressive. So this is just a proof of concept. Can we see the difference between these three different uh, simulations? Another interesting thing is that once this vehicle flies into the gust, obviously there's a finite length of the vehicle and a, and a shape of the gust. The front and aft lifting surfaces uh, sample different velocities at the same instance in time. And this is called the gust penetration effect. In the earlier part of our work, when we just used static lookup tables, we were just querying alpha, one single alpha for the whole vehicle. So we couldn't really capture this gust penetration effect. So when we did that same gust encounter back then, you see the moment the vehicle encounters the gust, it pitches down. Intuitively, you'd think as this wing enters the gust, the vehicle will pitch up first. And then as both wings enter the gust, static stability will take over and then the vehicle will pitch down. But if you don't take into account the gust penetration effect, you can't capture that pitch up. With our strict theory-based model now, there's the pitch up. And this is when the front wing has entered the gust, but the back wing has not. And so the vehicle is pitching up, and then the pitch down happens as both wings get into the gust field, and static pitch stability uh, begins to show its effect. Okay, here's an example of an asymmetric gust. Only right wing gets hit. 
So um, the lateral controllers come into play over there um, in trying to stabilize the bank angle of the, of the aircraft. Um, and this is just an expanded uh, view of the deflection and the twist of the tips of all four wings when it encounters uh, the, the gust. So it, it sets up a structural dynamic and then that, that dies down after some time. Uh, the final thing is a, a, a turbulence simulation. This is just using the von Karman turbulence model uh, that's part of Simulink. So basically turn on the turbulence and turn off the turbulence as you please. And then you can see how the vehicle uh, responds to that turbulence uh, field. So the control action is a little bit difficult to see because they're small, but the, the elevons are being deflected by the, by the control system to, to try to counteract the turbulence. And the severity of turbulence, of course, can be uh, can be varied uh, as well. So um, to summarize, we've got uh, our belief is we've got a reasonably good uh, proof of concept setup of the CLASP environment and getting information from flight stream. And if if we get uh, funding for phase two of our work, this is going to be our launching point, and we're going to add capabilities and most importantly for vertical flight mode. All our work has been uh, forward flight in this phase. So our top priority for uh, funded phase two, if it's funded, is uh, vertical flight mode for UAM type vehicles. Okay, um, uh, that's it from Roy and me today. If there are any uh, questions, be happy to take those. Thank you very much. Thank really you very much. For... Oh, there's an echo coming yes. through somewhere. Has uh, someone got the live stream open? Hey, hey, Brandon, I'll just mention real quick, uh, you can notice our website and my email address up there. If anybody has any uh, follow-on questions later on, uh, we'll be happy to put you in touch with them on or try to answer the questions related to flight stream. There are actually a couple more questions on the, uh, <clears throat> on the IO page. Um, the first one is, uh, what type of lookup tables are you grabbing from flight stream, i.e. aero tables, propulsion, etc.? Can you also grab them in OpenBSP for comparison as well? And if yes, can you show a demo? Yep, I'll be I'll be happy to answer that. Uh, let me just go back to the to a slide that helps me uh, answer that a little bit better. So in our uh, this slide right here. So in our uh, strict theory based uh, model, we basically so only the lifting surfaces are analyzed using strict theory. So for the rest of the airplane, so if you look at the fuselage and the vertical fins, which are considered to be uh, uh, rigid, we've we basically run flight stream. We've run the whole geometry in flight stream, and then we've created static lookup tables for the assumed rigid part of the geometry. So the fuselage and the effects of the fins, those are basically lookup tables for the three force components and the three moment components as a function of alpha, beta, and rates. And the strip theory model is for the flexible part of the vehicle. So the four wings, those are uh, strip theory. The implementation is general to the point where um, provided the lookup tables are in a, in a particular format, you know, like Z is a function of XY type of format, it's insensitive to whether that comes out of flight stream or whether that comes out of any other aerodynamic analysis tool. And this was actually one of the starting goals of the CLASP environment was it should not be married to any one source of aerodynamic data. So yes, if there's analysis coming out of uh, VSP Aero, I think that was the question. Uh, then yes, if we, we just have to get the lookup table into the into the agreeable format, and then we would be able to do the simulation. We do not have a demo of that at the moment, but uh, this is something we could definitely pursue in the future. Okay, we had a. <clears throat> I'm going to jump back and forth over to the YouTube. Does the swirl from the propulsors impact the forces generated by the controls? In phase one modeling, to the extent of phase one modeling, no. And the the integration between, uh, the interaction between aero and propulsion, uh, this is one of the main targets of phase two if it's funded. Okay. How does CLASP ensure that there's no unintentional fugoid setting in or an automated version of PIO, pilot-induced aut oscillation? The fugoid will have a time period that is uh, large enough that the moment you put the altitude hold controller in the loop, uh, that automatically will knock out the fugoid. 
So the, the time period for the fugoid is going to be uh, 20 seconds plus, probably. And so the moment you put any kind of, the moment you close the loop around this vehicle, uh, fugoid tendencies are going to go away. So a fugoid might be excited if there's a gust encounter, but it will be killed pretty quickly, as you saw in the simulations. PIO is, uh, to study PIO, we would have to put um, a mathematical model of the human pilot. So, so far, we've just done flight control systems. We would then have to put a mathematical model of the human pilot, which then commands the flight control system, which then commands the uh, control surfaces. Uh, and then we'd be able to study PIO. This is not something we've done within phase one. So there's no real result to show for it yet. Okay. Um, and then I th the last question that's up so far. Um, oh, here another one just came. But uh, how did you model the propulsors and the batteries and the electric propulsion system, I think, is what they're really asking. Got it. Uh, so let's let's take that from the uh, tail end. Uh, batteries, uh, modeling battery or the state of the propulsion, the state of the energy systems, that, that's not really within the scope of this particular project. This project is more about flight dynamics and uh, the, the trajectory of the, of the aircraft. So there's no modeling of batteries or their discharge rates uh, within the scope of this project. The other question was, uh, I think it was, uh, was it? Um, just the rest of the propulsion system. And I, I, I think yeah. the answer is that you just started at the propeller or the yeah. disc and you ignore everything that's, the disc is turning, uh, the propellers are turning and, and that's the way it is. Yes, and phase two will see, uh, say a blown, blown wing with an aft control surface, with a trailing edge control surface, which is deflected. So obviously, that's going to be the response is going to be dominated by the amount of blowing you've got over the wing and those are all phase two action items that we're really going to stress on if funded yes and then um is the mass properties model coming from open bsp the mass properties model is at the moment not coming from open bsp what we've done for phase one work is we've so the la8 is a wind tunnel scale model so smaller aircraft we've scaled it up to about a six and a half meter wingspan uh, basically kind of wingspan that you might expect for a one or two passenger UAM. And we've scaled up the mass properties accordingly based on um, just first order uh, principles, mass, uh, so the mass and the, the uh, inertia tensor. And those got scaled up just or estimated based on first principles. And the CG, we've located it uh, based on information we had about CG location from the Langley folks for their, for their wind tunnel model. So these are not coming from OpenVSP at the moment, but there's no reason why they can't.